Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. Can you make the case for why cardiovascular disease is worsened by or accelerated by sleep deprivation? And then same question I'm going to ask you in a moment for cancer. Just pick the best, like, because yep. again, you could write a book on each and of those topics. And we can go topics. into sort of yeah, the, yeah. And, and the book. But let me just give you one example for cardiovascular disease. There is a global experiment that is performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. And what we've seen is that in the spring, when we lose an hour of sleep, there is a subsequent 24% relative increased risk for heart attacks that following day, 24%. In the fall, when we gain an hour of sleep opportunity, there is a 21% reduction in heart attacks that following How day. How long has that been known? I mean, I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, that can't be right. And, you know, when you see it bi-directionally like that, it's very, diff- you know, that seems like a very robust manipulation. That's been known for probably about 10 years What's also interesting, and and I won't get away from cardiovascular disease, don't worry, but just simply to mention that when you look at that same transition, you see the same profile for car accidents, you see the same profile for suicidal attempts and suicide completion as well. What's also interesting, by the way, is that you see it in terms of um, federal judges handing out harsher sentences. They hand out harsher sentences on the Monday after that time change in the spring, because they're more moody, emotionally irrational, and less sort of, you know, empathetically sensitive because of that one hour of lost sleep. And in the fall, more lenient sentences. So I And can, does this effect last for two or three days? I'm so there sure. is a blast radius to it yeah. that you can see it, that it's better, but still worse in the spring, which is where you, you lose that hour of sleep. The effect is still worse on the, the second day. And it's almost recovered by the third day and finally comes back to what looks like a baseline by about day four. So there's a blast radius. And this is, you know, you know why I find this interesting? One hour of sleep. Yeah. And and here's the other thing I always found amazing about that statistic. In the Northern Hemisphere, you would predict the opposite if sleep were irrelevant, right? right? Wouldn't you think that gaining that hour of sunlight in the day, in the spring, Just the overall anticipation. I mean, there's virtually no one in the Northern Hemisphere that isn't happier (laughs) in April than they are in November, right? So so it's almost like you have all of that positive stuff working against you, and you still see the signal you just described. Yeah, so in the face... It's like a kick in the face. Yeah, so in the face of birds chirping, sunlight streaming, temperature warming, that one hour of lost sleep will still put, put you back on your derriere rather quickly in terms of all of these facets. So there's one example for cardiovascular disease. Another one, there was a fascinating study where they took a group of otherwise healthy middle-aged adults who had no sign of coronary artery disease, and then they tracked them for five years. And then they looked at how much sleep that they were getting. So again, hands up, this is essentially an associational longitudinal prospective study and it's, you, know, you can't derive causality from it. But what you can certainly say is when they started, they had no signs of calcification of the coronary artery. Those people in that study at the end of the five years who were getting five hours of sleep or less had a two to 300% increased risk of calcification of the coronary artery, which is the main corridor of life for your heart. If you have a massive coronary, essentially, when you hear that colloquially, you know, that's essentially what's happening there. So that you could have that calcium buildup on the basis of being bucketed into insufficient sleep, that tells me that it's not that when you are insufficiently slept, you also are someone who has calcified arteries. It is saying that if you are insufficiently sleeping, you are increasing your risk for developing that condition. This is about the development now, of that. how hard but- is it to control that for some obvious things that would track with that? For example, shift workers or people of lower socioeconomic status who are working three jobs and so all the other things so, that can work so against So there are you. exclusion, there's some great exclusion criteria in that study where they prevent those participants from entering the study. They also then added in other factors that you could imagine would lead to that. So they controlled for those things like 
exercise, BMI, neck circumference, smoking. They even include history of snoring. So they tried to take sleep apnea out of the equation. And still that relative risk was significantly larger. What do you think is the mechanism? I think the mechanism is probably several fold. I think the first thing that we see when we undersleep people is that they become much more sympathetically nervous system driven. Now that to some people may sound, oh, that sounds like a good thing. No, you have two branches of your automatic nervous system. I, I swear, for a moment, I thought you would say good knowing that the listener would understand that they're sympathetic and parasympathetic, but thinking you were you were gonna make a comment about being more high strung is better because, but no, you actually were making a joke. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I mean, love I, think, it. I think you're so well tuned to this. I think that's the the beauty. My IQ is so low. I'm so, such a, a simpleton that I can always revert to the naive state and I, I don't have to make assumptions. That's the beauty of my idiocy. But no, sympathetic nervous system being sort of cranked on your sympathetic nervous system is not a good thing. Your sympathetic nervous system essentially is your fight or flight branch of the nervous system. And what we find is that as soon as you start to undersleep an individual, that fight or flight branch of the nervous system starts to ratchet up. When that increases, you start to see, or perhaps the reason why it increases is that you get a greater amount of adrenaline release. You get a high spiking in levels of cortisol. You get a blunting in growth hormone. And I think probably just the cortisol and the growth hormone alone may set you on a path towards cardiovascular disease because we know that those are two factors that lead into that sort of some of that atherosclerotic sort of and, and equation. And that brings it back to uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is even if you just look at the epidemiologic data, the signal's quite large on the benefits of IGF and growth hormone more than any other disease in protection from neurodegeneration. So that may be, even in addition to everything you talked about with respect to clearance, you're simply taking away neurotrophic factors Correct. that are essential. There's some data, and I don't know how well replicated it is, I just read it in one study, where if you look if your APOE4, so this is in terms of your genes, there are some genes that can predispose you to Alzheimer's disease. On this podcast, there are wonderful descriptions of going into all of the details of these, but APOE4 significantly increases your risk for the development of Alzheimer's disease, it appears. But what's interesting is that if you are APOE4, but you are normotensive, you don't necessarily have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. If you are APOE4, but you are hypertensive, then your Alzheimer's disease risk is far higher. So in other words, there seems to be an interaction, a gene by cardiovascular disease interaction that leads that genotype to predispose you to Alzheimer's disease. And therefore, you know, if you are undersleeping, you are putting your self on a path towards many new different factors that we are learning regarding cardiovascular disease you know calcification of the arteries is one of them but we also just see you know blood pressure you know spike we can take someone who is in a lovely state of you know normotensive profile and has been and after either one night of total sleep deprivation or one night of short sleep, you know, we can almost start to see it after about reducing sleep by three hours, take someone down, down to five hours for just one night. You immediately see this spike in the fight or flight nervous system. Blood pressure goes up. You start to see cortisol increase. Heart rate starts to increase as well. You know, it's almost as though you've just got a beautiful car engine you've put it in neutral and you've put your foot on the gas pedal and you're just revving the living daylights out of that engine in a fight or flight state. Now, if you do that chronically, which is what most people do with insufficient sleep, you know, day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade, it's not surprising that, you know, just revving the daylights out of that engine, at some point, gaskets are going to start blowing. It's not designed to operate in that high revving state. All of Now, high revving occasionally, just fine. And if you have a beautiful, let's say, you know, 
Metzger Porsche engine, which loves to go to nine grand. And of course, you and as long I going, as it's in the GT3. Yeah. I had to geek out on cars for a little bit because I'm just so obsessed. I had to get it in there. <laughs> but, but even then, you just can't stay at that RPM, that high RPM for very long. You just know it from listening to the engine. You just know that mechanical badness is happening in neutral when you've got your foot on the gas pedal. Well, that's the same way with chronic sleep deprivation in your nervous system. So I think many of the cardiovascular effects. In fact, I think we're writing a paper right now. I think if there is one central common pathway through which we can understand almost all aspects of the deleterious impact of insufficient sleep, it is through the autonomic nervous system and specifically an excessive leaning on the fight or flight branch of the nervous system, which is to say that your sympathovagal balance is way off and you are far more in that fight or flight sort of aversive state. So I think that to me is where that disease pathology starts and perhaps progresses from that point.